Greetings from San Francisco Historical Society. I'm Alana Costantini, Executive Director, welcoming you to our new series of digital history resources. We decided to create this series in response to the coronavirus pandemic. With so many people sequestered inside, we asked ourselves, what can we do to help the history community stay engaged? Our answer is to offer a set of digital resources people can enjoy from home. These will include presentations, videos, articles, and mobile history apps. We'll be bringing them to you once a week. You'll get an email alert when the next digital resource is available. The first one is a presentation given by San Francisco Historical Society walking tour guide, Tom Jackson. Tom will take you on a virtual tour of San Francisco during the gold rush. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, and welcome to San Francisco Historical Society Digital Romp into Gold Rush History. I'm Tom Jackson, your guide. During our virtual stroll today, we'll visit the wharves along Montgomery Street and find out where the ghostly remains of gold rush ships are buried beneath the modern financial district. Your tour today will take about 30 minutes and there will be a fun quiz at the end. So let's go. Here we are outside of the historic first and oldest mint in San Francisco. The first mint on the West Coast was authorized on this site in 1852 and was open for operations in 1854. It was replaced with a four-story building in 1877 and used as a sub-treasury handling transactions between government and private business. The sub-treasury continued its operations here until the 1906 earthquake and fire. Subsequently, it was reduced to a one-story building and a basement with exterior brick walls and interior iron, iron columns. It is recognized as the California State and a San Francisco City landmark. It is also the home of the San Francisco Historical Society, which includes a museum on the first and bottom floors. But before we delve into the gold rush that made San Francisco an instant city, let's step back and take a look at those who came here before the 49ers. No, not Spain or Mexico or Russia, but the Ohlone people. This 1816 illustration shows the earliest views of the coast people. The double bladed paddle was a special innovation of the coast people with its pointed prow, the buoyant balsa boat could carry four people swiftly and easily into inlets and coves from island to island. The Spanish invention in this view is the woven striped blanket made by Ohlone women at the mission. The Ohlone people did not fare well under Spanish or subsequent Mexican rule. A different way of living, including forced labor, no pay, hunger, and disease caused a severe Ohlone population decline. In fact, when William Alexander Leedsdorf arrived in San Francisco in 1841, there were only a few Ohlones at Mission Dolores. By 1842, there were only eight Indians at the mission. Who was Alexander Leedsdorf? Well, he was born in San Croix, of a Danish father and a West Indian mother in 1810. He migrated to New Orleans in the early 1830s, where he was a successful businessman and became engaged to a Southern belle whose father forbade her to marry a biracial man. Heartbroken, he left New Orleans and made his way to California and became a prominent San Francisco citizen. Some of his achievements when he was here at the then Yerba Buena he had the first steamboat to transport goods and passengers on the bay. He built the very first hotel. He had a successful hide import export warehouse and he was on the first town council as well as being town treasurer. Unfortunately, Alexander died in 1848, just as gold was discovered. There are only a few prominent citizens buried in the chapel at Mission Dolores, and Leedsdorf is one of them. Tributes to his life can be seen in the financial district. Take a look at his memorial plaque 
on Leesdorf Alley near Sacramento Street and his life-size statue on Pine Street just off Leedsdorf Alley. Check it out when you have a chance. Let's see what San Francisco looked like in 1846. Actually, it wasn't called San Francisco yet. It was called Yerba Buena and it belongs to Mexico. The name Yerba Buena comes from a plant that grew wild on the sand hills. Here is what the city looked like. What do you notice? Well, there are very few buildings, no trees, ships in the shallow cove, also called Yerba Buena Cove. Notice the largest ship in the middle. That's the USS Portsmouth. And it's carrying Captain John B. Montgomery. The US is at war with Mexico and Captain Montgomery is here to claim this territory for the US. This particular illustration was done after 1846-47. And you'll note that one of the signatures testifying to its accuracy is General Mariano Vallejo. Let's take a closer look. What else do we see? Well, we see sand everywhere. We see a tall peak called Lone Mountain. The Leedsdorf Hotel is right here. And his warehouse is right here, just about at California and Leedsdorf today. And the population is about 500. So what streets do we see on this illustration? Well, we see Montgomery Street, named for Captain Montgomery, who raised the flag at Portsmouth Square on July 9th, 1846. We see Clay Street up the way, named for Henry Clay, a popular US Senator from Kentucky who ran for three times president unsuccessfully. Washington, of course, named for George Washington. And Kearney, or Kearney Street, which is misspelled here. And it was named after Stephen Kearney, a commander during the Mexican-American War and the military governor of the California Territory. Let's check out a few more things. This tiny island to the left of Montgomery Street it's really a sandbar. This shows how shallow the water is along Montgomery Street. You also see small boats called lighters along the shoreline because large ships had to stay in deeper water. Passengers and cargo were brought to shore in smaller rowboats. And then notice this little lagoon to the right of Montgomery Street. What street might that be today? Jackson Street, of course. And what building stands on this shoreline today? The Transamerica Pyramid. It stands on Montgomery Street between Clay and Washington. In fact, Montgomery Street today is nowhere near our current Embarcadero waterfront. So what happened? Well, the California Gold Rush happened. In 1848, gold was discovered. And in President Polk's annual address to the Congress in December of 1848, he told not only the United States about the gold rush, but also the entire world. And let it be known that there was abundant gold to be discovered and had in California. And the gold rush was on. Many thousands of people poured in to San Francisco and California. And by 1855, there were over 300,000 people in California. About half the people who came to California during the gold rush came by ship around the tip of South America. This area is called Cape Horn. Six to seven months was the average time to sail to San Francisco from the Eastern cities of New York, Boston, Philadelphia and Baltimore. Coming to California in the 1850s meant leaving your home and family behind for at least a year, if you came back at all. Most ships that came around the Horn were older ships like the one advertised here in this picture, the Apollo. You could book a one-way fare 
or he could book a round trip fare. But very few, if any, ships came back or made the return to the East Coast. So after six or seven months of travel on the open sea, braving high winds, storms, bad food, bad water, several of your shipmates have probably died and have been thrown overboard, you arrive in San Francisco. This is San Francisco in 1851. So one of the problems facing the newly arrived gold seekers was a lack of supplies and building materials that had to come in from the east. Here's an ad for the General Harrison ship that arrived in February 1851. It came from Boston and brought a load of building materials. So let's take a look at what we have in this cargo. We have 100,000 shingles, 10 two-story frame houses, 20 by 20. So the houses were built on the East Coast, stored in the ships and shipped around to San Francisco. We also have bricks, we have metallic paint, nails, carpenter's tools, oil, brushes, and 25 tons of coal. Back then in San Francisco, we had a housing shortage, something we can all relate to today. Men lived in tents that they made from the sails of ships, or they simply slept on the beach. That was fine through the summer, but in the fall, the rainy season started and the men started to look for better shelter. The answer to their problem was floating out in the bay. Hundreds of ships that brought gold seekers to California were abandoned in the bay. These could be used as shelter. I recall last December, 2019, Oakland briefly considered using cruise ships for homeless housing. And in 2002, Mayor Mike Bloomberg of New York City floated a similar idea. Maybe it's time to reconsider this. Let's take a 21st, a 20,000 foot look at what Yerba Buena Cove looked like in 1851. Here we have the outline of the shore at that time. There's a lagoon at Jackson Street. And we also have piers, lots of piers. The wharves and piers have been rapidly built into the bay since 1849. Now, legend has it that two rival piers the Market Street Pier and the Long Wharf or Central Pier were in a competition to see who could get to the deep water in San Francisco Bay. And as you can see, this deep water is out past our current Embarcadero today. So the race was on and the Market Street Pier apparently won the race. They got there first with the longest pier. However, the Long Wharf, not to be denied, although stopped here, did a dog leg and ended up not the first pier in Long Water, but the longest pier in Long Water. So another look of the water line, and we see Montgomery and Clay. And if we were standing here in 1851, we'd be standing in water. But what is standing there today? This is the Transamerica building where it is located today uh, in the Cove. But in 1849, with the aid of empty whale oil barrels tied to a hull for extra buoyancy, the Niantic was floated on a high tide into shallow water and secured hard aground near the intersection of Clay and Montgomery Streets. Not too long after she was joined, by other ships like the General Harrison and the Apollo. And they were used for warehouses, restaurants, bars, hotels, even prison ships like the ship Euphemia. And now here's another view of the Apollo. Looks a little bit different than we saw it earlier. 
the owners stripped off the masks off the ship. They built a barn on top and they used it as a warehouse. So it's attached to the long wharf and you can access it here and then walk up the stairs and go into the entrance of the warehouse. So you have tens of thousands of men living in wooden ships, tents, and roughly built buildings. There is no electricity, so they used candles and oil lamps. They spent a, time, a lot of time, allegedly, drinking and smoking. So what do you think happened? Fire, lots of fire. In fact, the city burned down almost completely six different times between 1841 1849 and 1851. The largest of these fires was in 1851. Fire burned for two days and turned the city into ash. The ships were burned down to their water line, leaving only their holes. Along with other ships, the General Harrison was also burned to its water line. So as you can see from this photo, the General Harrison was uncovered in 2002. And so marine uh, archaeologists and maritime experts had an opportunity to look at what was down there. So we see back here the stern of the uh, General Harrison. And it's about a 120 foot long ship, but the back end of it, uh, the stern is buried under another building. And here's the bow, which rests on the corner of Clay and Battery Streets. So if you go down to Clay and Battery Streets today, you can see evidence of the ship that is still buried under the building there. You'll even see nails from the ship's cargo that were recovered and then embedded in the sidewalk. After 1851, the bay was rapidly filled in and soon buildings covered what was once a watery cove. Oh, we have a question here from the audience. Uh, the question is, after the fires of 1851, how did they fill the bay in? That is an interesting question. So I guess if progress was going to be made, the bay needed to be converted to land, but with what? Uh, if you recall the 1846-47 illustration of Yerba Buena, one of the things you saw was lots of sand. In fact, San Francisco was about 75% sand. So they filled the bay up mostly with sand, 33 million cubic yards of sand. How much sand is that? Well, if you consider that a modern dump truck could hold approximately 20 cubic yards, it would take about a million, 250,000 dump truck loads of sand to fill the bay. So as San Francisco expanded and became more prosperous, it needed other faster means of communication. Overland mail service took about 23 days by via overland stage. And by sea, if you came up from Panama, it was longer. It took 30 days. Thus, there was a need for the Pony Express. Relays of men carried saddlebags and mail across a 2,000 mile trail from St. Joseph, Missouri, all along this yellow line, all the way to Sacramento, and then back. A trip averaged nine to 10 days, and even though the route was very hazardous, only one mail delivery was lost. The initial cost to mail a half ounce letter was $5 or almost, almost $840 in today's money. That rate was reduced to $2 by April 1861, but that was still a high price, the equivalent of over $300 today. Despite the cost, it is estimated that 35,000 letters were carried by the Pony Express. The Pony Express operated from April 1860 to October 1861. Why did it stop? Modern technology arrived in the form of the telegraph to put it out of business. The Wells Fargo Museum on Montgomery Street has a Pony Express exhibit. And while you're there, seeing the 
Pony Express, use their Wells Fargo stagecoach camera to take yourself, to take a photo of yourself in front of a real stagecoach. Okay, now on to our bonus stop. The Merchants Exchange has been associated with San Francisco's maritime industry since 1851. The original building was on Battery Street. This is the second building at this site on California and Montgomery. The building was constructed in 1903, but destroyed in a 1906 earthquake and fire. Willis Polk, the architect, had the foresight to hire Julia Morgan to do the interior design of the lobby and club area. Julia Morgan commissioned William Coulter, a well-known nautical painter, to paint the five sailing murals in the exchange meeting place. The sixth painting was done by a Norwegian, Nils Hagerup. So we're looking at his most famous mural titled, Arrived All Well. The title was a familiar phrase chalked on blackboards in the trading hall to confirm a ship's safe arrival. This painting shows a sailing ship coming through the Golden Gate at sunset. But what's missing? That's right, the Golden Gate Bridge, which was not built until 1937. As we walk out of the Merchants Exchange trading hall, we note the early movers and shakers of San Francisco. Their sculpted character faces looked down on us. Who are they? We know them as street names today, from left to right, O'Farrell, Davis, and Montgomery. We are back at the first mint. And before I let you go, there is one thing you should know about our mint, because not everybody who worked there was on the up and up. Apparently, there was some gold missing from the mint, because in August 1857, when police searched William Ben, alias Carl Klops's room, they found gold coin blanks, gold working and smelting tools. He was arrested for stealing thousands of dollars of gold cuttings. The Mint's enterprising chief coin cutter had melted down stolen gold cuttings and sold the resulting bars back to the Mint through Wells Fargo. And now, the quiz. Where is the first mint located? Who was here in San Francisco before Spain and Mexico? Who is a prominent pre-Gold Rush citizen buried in Mission Dolores Chapel? What is the name of the street near Montgomery and Clay that used to be a lagoon? And five, what were the ships abandoned in Yerba Buena Cove used for? The answers. One, where is the first mint located? Commercial Street. Who was here before Spain and Mexico? The Ohlone people. Who is a prominent pre-Gold Rush citizen buried in Mission Dolores Chapel? William Alexander Leedsdorf. What is the name of the street near Montgomery Clay that used to be a lagoon? Jackson Street. And five, what were the ships abandoned in Yerba Buena Cove used for? Hotels, warehouses, restaurants, bars, and even prisons. Thank you for joining us on San Francisco Historical Society's virtual tour, Sunken Ships, Hidden Treasure. Please mail your feedback to Lana Costantani at lana at history sf at lana at sfhistory.org.